Hello everyone and welcome to the 29th Hammer tutorial in the version 2 series. This tutorial applies to any Source Engine games that use the Vscript language. I will be using CSGO to create this video. But first, thanks to BenQ for sponsoring this video. BenQ offered to send over a screen bar plus, and while it looked interesting even before they offered, I recently got an ultra-wide curved monitor so I wasn't quite sure if it would work. After setting it up quite quickly, I found that I can just move it over to the right side of my monitor, and it works very well even though the monitor is massively curved. The control pod is really nice looking, sits next to my mouse pad, and easily lets me find whatever brightness or color temperature I want to use for that time of day. However, I'm usually working at about 5 a.m. to get whatever map I'm working on wrapped up. Sometimes, if you are feeling a little lazy, you can just hit the auto button and it will use the little light sensor on the control pod base to find the perfect brightness for you. Check out the links in the description to find out how to snag one for yourself. If you don't know what games support vScript, you can head over to the vScript page on the VDC and scroll down a little bit, and here are the games that currently support it. If you're unsure what you can do with vScript, you can do a lot of things that the built-in I.O. system is incapable of handling. You can go as far as to create custom game modes or just make your life a lot simpler when creating map logic. We would normally start doing stuff inside of Hammer, but things are going to be a little bit different today. Today we're going to be using a program called Visual Studio Code. If you don't have it downloaded, I suggest you go download it and install it. Once Visual Studio Code is open, for now just click File and Open Folder. From here, you'll want to browse to your CSGO install directory, select the Scripts folder, and vScripts. Then just hit Select Folder. And over on the left, it will open all of our vScript folders. Let's right click in this empty space here and create a new file. For the file name, call it whatever you want your script file to be named. I'm going to call mine tutorial29 and give it the file extension of .nut. If you've ever written code before, you know an IDE with a couple quality of life things like a linter or syntax highlighting or autocomplete can really make your life a lot better. I would highly suggest before you even get started, to install vscript snippets for CSGO from the extensions section, the squirrel language linter, along with the electric imp squirrel extension. This extension will provide syntax highlighting. The linter will let you know if you have problems with your code, like open brackets that are missing, and the vscript snippets just gives you some autocomplete functions. I'll put a link to these in the comments below, or you can just search the extension marketplace with the names that you see here. We can collapse this sidebar by just clicking on that icon again and close out of that. Let's start with every programmer's first thing, and that's just going to be hello world. We're going to start by typing the word function, and then just call this hello world, and then give an open and close bracket, and then hit enter, and two curly brackets. So this is going to be a function that we can call inside of a game. And to start with, we're going to just print a line that says hello world to the game console. So we can type print L, which stands for print line, open parenthesis, and then inside a quote, because we're going to type a word here, just type hello world, and save the file. Now let's place the logic script inside of Hammer that will let us actually execute that code. So let's place a new entity with the entity tool, change it to logic script, and let's give it a name. The name doesn't really matter. We'll just call it my script. And then under entity scripts, click manage, and then the plus icon. And then you'll want to browse to your CSGO scripts, vscripts directory, select the file that we created, and hit OK. And that should pop up here. If it doesn't pop up here, you can just type the name in. That does not matter. The location of the script is irrelevant. And now we just need something to trigger it. I have a little brush button right here. I'll press Control T to make it an entity and tie it to a func button. I want don't move set on the flags and then the delay before reset to be 0.1. Now under outputs, let's click add on pressed. And we want to target the logic script. And we want run script code. And the parameter override is actually the function name that we have declared here. So we can copy that, paste it right here, and then just hit apply. And now we can compile the map. So back in Hammer, since we're just printing something to the console, the button really doesn't show us anything's happening. 
uh, if we open console, we can see hello world here because I did press the button. Let's turn on developer one and then MP restart game one. So now we have the developer messages in the top left. When I push this button, we should see hello world and it does keep showing up. If we want to edit the code, we can do that. We hold shift alt and then hit the down arrow. We can copy that line um, and we can say hello world. This is a test. And then if we save the script and then just type MP restart game one. And we come back over here. The script has updated and we get hello world. This is a test. Now let's switch this to use a variable instead of hard coded text. If you're unfamiliar with a variable is just know we can write them to save data, change it and call it back later whenever we want. If you're unsure what's happening, just copy it down and it should kind of click along the way. So to start with a variable, we'll type local. This means a local variable, which is accessible inside of this function. Intro text equals and we'll type. Intro text with an exclamation point, and then we'll switch this print line. We say intro text and then we'll do intro text equals I am a variable and then we'll change the second print line to use that as well. So what this will do is we set a variable to say intro text. We print that variable, then we change the variable to say I am a variable and then we print that same variable. So we'll save that and then go to MP restart game one inside of CSGO that reloads the script. When I come over to the button and press E on it, it says intro text, I am a variable. So that's how you declare a local variable. Now let's write a function that will manipulate a player. Specifically, what I want to do is have it so when a player walks through the store, they get turned around. The first step to that is figuring out where they're currently looking, and then we need to manipulate that value. If we look on the vscripts VDC page, and hit list of vscript functions. Under the C base entity section, we can see that there's a bunch of functions that pretty much every entity should have. What we're interested in is get angles, which gives us a vector back of the entity's pitch yaw role. On a player object, this is going to contain where they're looking. To make that function, let's go back to our vscript file and let's type function. Let's call it turnaround and then create our two sets of brackets again. And we want to target the activator in this IO chain. You may remember on the IO chain, you could do something like under target entity's name, you could type exclamation point activator to target the player itself. You may have parented something to the player before using this method. This is the exact same concept. We're just targeting a specific item in the IO chain, which in the script is still called activator. So we'll type local angles. We want to create a variable called angles equals activator dot get angles. And this will store the angles of the player inside of this local variable. Now we need to manipulate them. To do that, we will use activator dot set angles. And this is looking for a pitch yaw roll. If we look under set angles, we can see here it looks for three variables, which are of the float data type, which is you know, number dot dot dot, basically a decimal value. So we need to get the angles X, Y, and Z out of this object here. Since get angles returns a vector, the only thing we have to do to access those is type angles dot X. And then under yaw, angles dot Y, and then angles dot Z. Now that we have that, this will do absolutely nothing for us because all we're doing is we're getting our angles and then setting them to the exact same thing that they already were set to. What we want to manipulate is the Y value. If we just toss a negative 180, because there's 360 degrees to the angle, 180 will make us flip around. So let's save that and then come into hammer, grab our trigger texture and create our trigger multiple inside of this door here. Under outputs, click add on start touch, the logic script, run script code. And remember that we want this function name, which is turn around. Paste that in there. And now we can compile the map. 
We attempt to walk through this door. We get turned around. So you may be curious what's actually happening here. And a useful thing when working with Squirrel, because we don't get proper debug tools, is you'll use printl a lot to see what's going on. So I'm going to clear my console here. We'll jump back here. And I'm going to add a printl right here. And we're just going to type the angles variable right there. We'll save the script. And now when I reload the game, we can see the angle that I'm looking at pre-change. So you can see that I was looking at 90. So this will help you debug something. If you're unsure what a variable value is, you just type printl and then toss your variable in there and it'll output it to the game console for you. There's one small thing that is weird about how this works now. If I move into it, you may notice that I kind of continue moving the direction that I was moving as I touch the trigger. That's because we're only changing the player's view and not his angular momentum. Since we're moving just by thrust, we keep that momentum going even though we instantly snap to a different direction. To fix this, all we have to do is go back into our script and we need to manipulate the velocity of the player as well as the angles. So if we create a new line called activator.set velocity and this is looking for a vector this time but we still need to get the player's velocity and if we look at the list of functions there is a get velocity and this gives us a vector back so all we have to do is inside of here we can type activator dot get velocity and we need to invert that so if we do times minus one because when you multiply something by negative one it's the inverse of that. So by inversing uh, our velocity, we will not have that little bump. So let me restart the game. And now when I go into that, I just keep moving on perfectly. That is much better. There are situations where you would want some randomness to happen in your map. So let's make another variation of this function that only turns you around sometimes. Let's create a new function and called turn around sometimes. And all we're going to add here is a check to see if a number lands on what we want it to. And if it does or it doesn't, um, do or don't flip. To do this, we'll just use an if statement. So we'll type if. And if we want a 50% chance, we can use a random int. So we'll type random int. And this is a function that Valve has made, which is right here. Random int generates a random integer within a range inclusive, which means that min and max will show up. Other program languages are exclusive, but this one is inclusive. So whatever we put in min can show up, whatever we put in max can show up. So for a 50% chance, we want 0 and 1. And now if we say if random int equals equals 0, let's say print L, not flipping this time. And then underneath this, we can just type return. The return keyword will return us out of this function as soon as this line is read. So if you want to stop code from running in this function, you just return from it, and that'll stop it dead in its tracks. Now, if we just add one more line and we call the regular turn around function, we'll now have a 50% chance of turning around because if random one or zero, which is basically a coin toss, equals zero. So if zero shows up, we don't flip. If one shows up, this code is never run, and then this is evaluated, and we run this code as normal. So let's copy, let's copy turn around sometimes. Inside of Hammer, let's just shift drag this door over to the other side, change the output to say turn around sometimes, hit apply, and then recompile the level and give it a shot. So that one turned us around around and now we see it says not flipping this time so we got it twice 
So you can see that there's some randomness between if it will actually flip me or if it won't. The next function we'll write is a jump pad over these spikes. Similar to turning the player around, we need to get their velocity and then manipulate it. We'll hop into our script here and then type function boost. That's what I want to name it. And let's start by getting the player's velocity. So we'll create a local, we'll call this vel, and then we'll do activator.getVelocity. And similar to this line up here, we'll do activator.setVelocity. However, we can't just invert the entire vector that represents their velocity. We need to create a new vector and then only invert the z value. We can reference the vector constructor here. So we'll create a new vector just by typing vector and then providing the x, y, and z values that we want it to have. So inside here, we'll type vector, open and close parenthesis, vel.x, comma, vel.y, comma, vel.z. So what this is saying is create a new vector and we're just giving it the normal x, y, and z values that we already have. However, when we get to z, we want to multiply that by negative 1. Then, because it's a boost pad, I'd like the player to get more out of it than they put into it. So I'm going to multiply the entire thing by 1.5. Now inside hammer, we can create the trigger multiple that's going to drive this function. But outputs add on start touch. We'll select the script, run script code, boost, open and close parentheses, hit apply, and recompile the map. Over by the trigger now, if we jump down, we get more speed out coming into it and we bounce up. Now let's make a change so the jump pad only works so many times. To do this, we'll need a variable that will increment every time we jump on the pad. Let's start by creating that variable. We'll just call it local use count equals zero. And then we'll say use count plus plus which just says whatever my current value is, add one to it. And we'll type print L and we'll say used count. And we want to tack this variable onto the end. So if we hit space plus use count, it will tell us the use count. If we create a if statement now, we can determine if use count is greater than or equal to three, print L disabled booster. Now you may have spotted the logic flaw here. Every time this code runs, we're creating a new variable, setting it to zero, and then incrementing it. So every time this code runs, this is just going to end up as one. That's because this can't be a local variable. It needs to be declared in the global scope of the script. To move this to a global function, let's just delete it from here. And then outside of the function, so just right above the function, we can type use count. And then when we put a little arrow, zero. This is just squirrel syntax for a globally defined variable. And this is it being created. So now when one of these functions in the script is wanting to know what the value of use count is. It already knows what it is, and it will never reset unless we tell it to or the round resets. We actually need to disable a booster still, and we're going to do that using ent fire. To do that, we need to name the trigger. We'll name it jump pad. So that's just a regular old name on that. And then inside of our script, we'll create a new line and we'll call it ent fire. And ent fire is looking for a target and an action. These other values have defaults set, so we only need to include them if we plan to change them from their defaults. For our use case, all we'll do is ENT fire jump pad, comma, disable. Make sure you use the right data type, otherwise you will encounter errors. The VDC does have the data types defined, so we want a string action and string target. So make sure these are wrapped in quotes. Let's recompile the map since that entity name changed. Now, when we come over here, we can see use count one, use count two, 
and then use count three, disable booster, and it does not turn on again, and I'm stuck in the pit. And it will not turn back on until we restart the game. We go back over here, the jump pad is working again for a total of three usable bounces. Now I'd like to create a function that every round players spawn, it will change their max health to 150. We can use a hook function, which if we go up to C base entity, there's these hooks there. If any of these hooks are declared, it will automatically run in the appropriate situation. The one that we're interested in is on post spawn, which is after the entity has spawned. So meaning when a round restarts, all the entities will spawn along with the players and this code will run. To use this, we just create a new function and we'll call it function on post spawn. Just by having the function with the name on post spawn, it will execute. I'm going to put a little bit of debug information at the top here that just says running on post spawn. And I'll copy that so we can see that code is actually running. Now we need to find all of the players and then do something to them. We can do this with find by class name. And this will find entities with a specific class name. Now we want to get all of them and this system works great for it. It's just a little counterintuitive. So pretty much just copy down what I write and it'll it'll click once you see it. So type local and then just play equals null. Now we'll create a while loop that says play equals entities dot find by class name. And the previous is going to be play and the class name will be player. Now we create curly brackets here and essentially what's going to happen is it's going to iterate over all the players and if we are inside of these curly brackets, the code will run against a player with the handle play, which means if I write code that says play dot set max health 150, every player entity will have set max health 150. We know about set max health because it's under the C base entity, which is right here. And there's also a set health. So setting the max health puts their maximum health to 150, and then I want to set their health to 150 as well. I don't need to recompile the map for this because it was just a script change. So I will MP re start game. And then when we reload, I now have 150 health and my code says running on post spawn. There's still a few more things that I'd like to show you. And next we're going to be coloring chicken entities. First, we just need to make some chickens that we can color. I'll create a chicken here, and then I will just shift drag these around a whole bunch. I will copy and paste this button because we're going to use that to actually run the script code. And now let's go back into our vscript and let's create a function here called chicken party and open and close curly brackets. And just like with iterating over all of our players. We want to do the same thing for chicken. So we can just copy and paste that whole thing um, and just kind of update these names here. So all I did was copy and paste that whole chunk, update all these variables, and then change the class name to chicken. And then instead of setting their health, so what we want to do is change their color. And we're going to do this by just changing the render color value on the entity itself similar to when you set a render color on something like a prop dynamic. It's actually this FX color right here. If we turn smart edit off, we can see that it is render color. Let me just set that back to white. And then back in our script, we're going to type local color. And we want to create the color string itself, which is a string that's 255, 255, 255 for RGB. And we're going to do this with random int again, except the min is zero and the max is 255. Now, because it's a string, we need to put some spaces in between each number value. So if we hit plus and then open quote space, close quote plus. This is going to create the integer space. And then we just copy this 
all again. And then one more time. And I get rid of that. So we should have a number between 0 and 255, space, number 0, 255, number, space. And let's just take a quick look at what that looks like in the console. So we'll, we'll just do print L, and then we'll type chicken open. And I'm going to put a bracket here so we can see what the actual string looks like. And then we'll put color plus close and then bracket chicken color. And lastly, just change the output here to be chicken party instead of we had hello world here. So we'll buy that and then we will recompile. Now that we're back in game, I'll walk up and press E on this button. And we see all of the RGB values that represent what colors those chickens would have become. Clear that console. Let's go back to tutorial 29. And let's just add a new line here. And this is where we're going to actually add that value, the render color key value to the chicken. So we'll type chick dot, and this is two underscores key value from string. And these are up at the top here. Um, and they set a key value based on what kind of data type you're providing to them. And the RGB value is a string, so we'll just do key value from string. And the key is render color, and you need to make sure that you provide that as a string. And then the value is just color. So we'll save that, and we'll come back in game, MP, restart game one. We come over to the button, and we hit E on it. All of the chickens have changed to a new color, and if we keep pressing E on it, they will keep changing color as well. Disco chickens are quite cool, but now let's blow up some chickens. So let's copy this button over, and let's just change the function name to chicken hopper, and we'll end up creating a new function with this. So right under chicken party, we'll do function chicken popper, and what this is going to do is it's just going to find the closest chicken to us and pop it. The first thing we do is we create a local and we're going to call this found chicken. So this is the chicken that it found. And it's going to equal, similar to entities find by class name, we're going to do entities dot find by class name nearest. So what this is doing is it's going to find the closest instance of a class name relative to a point within a radius. So the class that we're looking for is chicken. The origin is going to be the player. So activator.getOrigin. And just like before, you know, get origin right here returns a vector. And the radius, if we want to do the whole map, we would just plug in just a pretty high value right here. But for instance, this could be useful if you only want to kill chickens within 200 units of yourself. I want it to do the whole map, so I'm going to do just a bunch of nines. And now we will run ENT fire by handle. Now what this does is those chickens don't have a class name, but I have what's referred to as the entity handle in my variable found chicken. So I want to tell my found chicken to do the action of break. Now, unlike with ENT fire, where these values are declared with defaults, so we just need the string and the target, these are not. So we have to put a whole bunch of nothing in the rest of these to get the function to work, otherwise we'll encounter an error. So for value, we just do empty parentheses right there. The delay is 0.00. .00. Or 0, 0.0, the activator is null and the color is null. Save that and let's recompile because we copied a button over. The map reloaded. If we come over and push this button, that's our disco button, but this is the chicken popper button. And this will get the closest chicken to me every time. Boop. Now let's create a function that will heal the player. If we go back to our script, Let's create a new function and call it heal. And instead of just having empty parentheses here, type amount. What this is going to allow us to do is pass in a variable to this function 
that can change depending on situations. So from Hammer, I'll end up having a button that will heal me 10 life or 25 life. Now we need to determine the health that we're going to set the player to. So we'll create a local and we'll say target health and it's going to be activator dot get health plus amount. So we can't just tell the player to heal. What we need to do is get the user's current health, add the amount we want to heal them to, and then we'll end up setting that amount. However, you can overheal players. So if we don't guard based on what their max health is, they can just keep healing over and over. So the next thing we'll do is we'll create a local and it'll be max health equals activator dot get max health. The reason we're using get max health instead of just typing something like 100 in here is because we have this code here that's changing their max health. And we don't want to hard code things if possible, because let's say my game mode they need 175 health then. So that that will allow us a little bit more flexibility. In fact, let's set my max health to 200 and my starting health to 150. So now I'll have 50 available HP um, to heal when I load up. Now we will create an if statement here, and it's going to say if target health is greater than max health, which would mean we would end up overhealing, we'll say activator dot set health and we're going to set it to the max health because if we overheal we just want to go to whatever their max health is and now if we drop down another line we can type else meaning if it's not going to be over that we can do activator dot set health to target health now previously i did a if statement with curly brackets here that was because we had two lines that we needed to include in that. Squirrel does support single line ifs, which is what this is, where if we're only running one line of code, you can just drop down one line without the curly brackets, and then same thing for else. I'll hit save here, and then we'll go to hammer, and let's copy the chicken killer buttons over. And then on this one, we'll just change chicken party to heal. And we'll put 10 in here. And then we'll copy and paste this output over here and make this 25. So what we're doing is we're calling the heal function with the amount of 25. Now I must warn you, never put a string value inside of this box. It will not work and it has a very strong chance of corrupting your VMF file that you then need to go fix manually in Notepad. So if you ever need to pass a variable into a function from hammer, you cannot use the string type, use something else. Let's click apply and then recompile. Here I am back in game. I have my chickens back. I have 150 HP. This button will heal me 10. But now I can't go over 200. I'm just going to ram myself into the ground. And this one will heal me 25 but it will only put me up to my max health of 200. The last function I'd like to show you is giving the player a random weapon from a predetermined list that you've set up. You can add every weapon to this list and it works perfectly fine. I'm doing it this way to show you guys how arrays work because I would be doing you an injustice if I didn't show you arrays. So let's start by copy and pasting this button over here. And we're just going to change the script code to give weapon and we'll write that function in a second. However, we're going to create a few game player equips here. You are able to do this all within vscript, but it is cleaner and just easier to have the vscript work with entities in the map sometimes. So I'll create this game player equipped under flags. I want use only and strip same weapon type. Under class, I will add a key value of weapon op like I normally do. And then we'll shift drag this over and we'll change that to AK 47. I don't know if the ammo value carries over. I've always done this since Counter Strike Source. So I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep doing it. Um, and then we'll also add a P90. 
and let's do a instead of a deagle e250 i don't know what that has these days 28 something like that if you're unfamiliar with what i just did there you can have a game player equipped give you a weapon by turning off smart edit and then just adding the key value of the weapon you want to give the player we set use only and strip same type and that's all we have to do I'll compile the level, but we'll head over to our script now. The first thing that we want to do is collect all of the possible game player equips that are on the level, and we're going to store those in an array. Since we're going to be accessing this across functions, because we're going to only do collection on post spawn, and then there will be the give weapon function, which we created or are calling right here. So we'll create that now function give weapon. But we'll need to collect them in post spawn and then actually give the weapon in this function here. So just like before, we're going to do find entities by class name, except we're going to use the equip. So I'll just copy and paste that and update these variables and then change the class name to game player equip. So this is going to collect all of my game player equips and let's create a global variable that is an array so we'll call this weapon equippers and we do that little arrow thing to declare that it is a global function and just an open and close bracket this means that this is an array and an array is a data type that contains many things of a type so this is essentially going to be like a shopping list of game player equip and then we'll end up picking one of them off of that list so inside this while loop here, where we're collecting our game player equips, we'll just type weapon equippers dot append. And inside the append, we put equip. So this append is coming from one of the squirrel reference. If we look array dot append, this method adds the value passed to the end of the target array. So this is us just adding the thing to the array. There's other ways to do this. I think this is the cleanest uh, way to do it. So basically, take all my game players' equips, add them to my array at the top. And now inside the give weapon, we first need to get the index or the item on the list. So we'll type local and just call this target equals, it's going to be a random int and the low value is zero, but the max value, we don't know how many game player equips there are. So we need to look at how long this array is. So we'll do weapon equippers.len, which is length. That vscript snippet is wrong. Don't use it. Um, the len is right here, which just returns the length of the array for us. And since this is an inclusive random int, but arrays are zero indexed, which means that the first item is at index zero. We need to minus one off the end of the array here. So in my map, we have five. So the len, the length of the array is five. So this would say without the negative one, we're getting a value zero through five, but that's six total choices because we have zero, one, two, three, four, five. So we subtract one off of the length, and then we get exactly what we want. Now we will ENT fire by handle. And the target is going to be weapon equippers. And we're going to put a square bracket here and target. So what this is saying is we're going to target whatever position in the, the array. And we're going to do an action of use. The value is, is just two empty quotes. The delay is 0, 0.0. And now the activator is actually just activator because that's the regular activator in the IO chain. And we can also make the um, handle at the end, anti fire by handle, the handle caller, handle activator. We'll just set those both to be the player himself. And we can save that. And if we map reload we didn't put any information there so let's go back really quick and then just put print l i found weapon equippers dot len 
possible weapon, possible equippers. So we'll save that, and then we'll MP restart game again. So now when we restart the game, we see I found five possible equippers. We'll come over to this button over here, press E on it. We got an AWP, Deagle, AK. So it's just randomly going through, giving us a different weapon every time we push E on it. So now if you wanted to add more weapons, you could just keep copying and pasting all of those game player equips till you have the whole arsenal that you wanted to give players. Finally, if you want the script that I created here, I'm going to add comments to all of this code. So you can download that with a link in the description below so you can use it as a learning tool. That's going to wrap it up for my vScript tutorial. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. Feel free to subscribe if you like this sort of content whenever I get time to post. Thanks for watching and happy mapping.